In 2005, a new airplane took to the skies. Born as a luxury corporate jet, it had been transformed into America's latest and most capable atmospheric observatory. Hyper, the high-performance, instrumented, airborne platform for environmental research. Scientists had dreamed of a plane like this for more than two decades. It took four years and the engineering skills of hundreds of people to construct and customize it. This is the story of the birth and development of Hyper. Yeah. And the people who dreamt it, built it, modified it, and the team of scientists, engineers, and pilots who will fly Hyper across our planet in coming decades. Savannah, Georgia, Gulfstream Aerospace. NSF's Jim Hunting <laughs> takes ownership of Hyper on behalf of the American public. <laughs> there we go. Keys to the new plane are handed over to NCAR's chief pilot. Project manager Krista Lorson leads the crew of the first flight on board. The G5 has twin Rolls-Royce engines, each packing almost 15,000 pounds of thrust. Gulfstream's test pilot shows his customers what a hot rod they've acquired. That was exciting. That was very exciting. Climb out of Savannah with a nose up attitude of probably about 30 degrees, flying up and then doing a 45 degree turn. It exemplifies the kind of, of flying that this aircraft can do. It may handle like a sports car, but it has to be a research workhorse for decades to come. With a range of over 6,500 nautical miles, Hyper can fly around the entire United States without refueling. We can cover parts of the world and parts of the atmosphere that we couldn't before. For the next few years, there's still projects that are already starting to line up. You know, people who want to take the aircraft to California, Sierra Nevadas, there's one project wants to take it to fly out over Antarctica. As the world prepares for International Polar Year, Hyper will be able to reach Earth's most remote regions to study global climate change. This should provide us an ability to get there and conduct some chemistry, some radiation experiments that are especially important for climate. The H in Hyper stands for high performance reaching altitudes no other civilian research aircraft can attain and stay at. The upper part of its flight envelope is especially important to us. That's been a hard one for us to cover. Once fuel has burned off, the pilots take her up to 51,000 feet, maximum design altitude. 51. That feels good, nice and smooth up here. Regular G5s reach 51K, but Hyper presented unique challenges. Special openings for science instruments had to be retrofitted through the plane's thin skin. This fuselage is really only, it's less than a sixteenth of an inch thick. A 21 inch diameter viewport had been cut into the upper fuselage, with two more on the bottom. Months of CAD CAM simulations and analysis preceded the modification. It was just one of a series of technological firsts for Hyper. Anytime you cut a hole in this airplane, you've got to trace all of the effects of that through the airframe, front, back, all the way around the fuselage. So that, that's something that's new on this type of aircraft. One of the critical missing pieces in our understanding of Earth's climate is the role of clouds. The G5's ability to climb high and look down on storms and follow them as they develop should fill that gap. Those are all scientific challenges, but they require engineering solutions. Putting instruments high up in the stratosphere is why Hyper was commissioned and why it was such an engineering challenge to modify.
Like every Gulfstream, Hyper was born on the production line in Savannah, Georgia. Metal parts start off painted green to protect them during manufacturing. It looks complicated, and it is complicated, but if you invest a little time and you know, have some mechanical abilities about you, it's very easy. If the engines fail, then the plane fails, so you kind of take your job serious, and you, you know, it's, it's gratifying. You know, it's, it makes me feel good at the end of the day, knowing that I worked on something that is the uh, lifeline of the airplane. You treat it like it's your own. You know, this is my baby. I'm going to make sure that it's going to come out crystal clear. This high-tech work needs both teamwork and diversity. You really have to want to be a team player. You really want to have to work together. If you don't work together, I mean, you're going to, you bump heads. I mean, we're, da we're down here all the time in each other's face, and, you know, so you, you got to really just talk to each other, communicate. Makes it go by really easy. For most Gulf Streams, the end of the production line is where construction stops. But for Hyper, the biggest challenges still lie ahead. It was just a short flight to Lockheed Martin Logistics in Greenville, South Carolina, but it would take another two years to make the complex modifications needed to turn this regular G5 into a sophisticated research aircraft. Lockheed's technicians have been preparing for months. Any problems in cutting that first opening could derail an $81 million project. Okay, I think everybody knows what to do. Uh, Randy and Steve's gonna be cutting a hole. Be safe, measure twice, cut once, and uh, have a great day. No, no. There it is. A shiny doubler provides reinforcement for Hyper's thin fuselage. A circle of guide holes outlines where the first cut will be made. Now he'll, he'll follow that same pattern all the way around and then uh, we'll come back and cut from hole to hole. Should have drilled like a smiley face pattern, you know? <laughs> Get ready to cut a hole. Yep. Connect the dots. With millions of dollars and 20 years of planning at stake, this may not be brain surgery, but it's close. Here we go. All right, got it. How you doing, buddy? Got something accomplished today. A good day's work, but it had taken many years to get here. The atmospheric science community had been asking for Hyper for two decades. In 2003, an advisory group of scientists and engineers got down to details. Exactly where should those viewports be placed to do the best science? How much weight could be assigned to a lavatory and galley? How might the science payload affect Hyper's range and altitude? The advisors leave PowerPoints behind and travel to Greenville to inspect the plane. NCAR engineers clamber through the G5's cramped cargo space, trying to figure out where to install science instruments and support systems. There'll be uh, the water for the uh, lavatory and the sink and be in here, too big water, uh, water tank. Space was limited, and so was time and budget. They still had to decide on a design for the pods, which would house key research instruments, such as radars, slung beneath the G5's slender wings. It was an engineering challenge with financial implications. We take it out, spend a lot of money, test fly it, find out that it's just going to be too restrictive. Or they could modify existing larger like units, that, so. which might be cheaper, or come up with a brand new design, which would be smaller yeah, and lighter. But that meant okay. new testing and new costs. Days of discussion between Gulfstream, Lockheed, NCAR, and NSF were needed to figure out who would pay for it. 
I'm sorry, but that latter point was never made clear to us. We had drawn it. Sometimes it almost seemed as if cutting holes in the fuselage was easy in comparison to cutting costs and keeping on schedule. Yeah, give it a little more juice. We kind of feel like cutting the viewport openings was one thing. More than half a year later, Lockheed needs to be able to prove to the FAA that the modifications leave the plane as airworthy as before. Of course, the high blow test is a huge program milestone. Um, one of the riskiest tests that we uh, felt we needed to accomplish on this program, um, primarily because there's a lot of, of strain data that we needed to correlate from what we predicted to what we actually measure on the airplane, and that's something the FAA has been very interested in too. Pumps force air into the modified fuselage. They're like my kids, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It takes almost two hours to get to a differential pressure of 17.5 pounds per square inch equivalent to the stresses of being high up in the stratosphere. Starting the clock. All right. Oh, right on top too, oh boy. Windows bulge. For safety reasons, nobody's allowed in the hangar. 40 <laughs> seconds to go. No, no loud noises yet. No, let's keep it that way. 20 seconds to go. If there's a problem, this amount of pressure could buckle the airframe. Five, four, three, Two, one, okay, go ahead and come on down, control. 17 and a half for 60 seconds. We're good to go. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably sleep a little bit better tonight, you know, than a half a while. I didn't get any sleep last night. And then I look at the production guys, the efforts they've done to get ready. They've been doing it for two or three times as long as that, working every single day, seven days a week. But she didn't break. The testing all looked good, but Hyper's first flight after more than two years on the ground at Lockheed would be definitive proof. Later flights might be routine, but for now, Hyper was still an experimental aircraft. Test pilots were in charge. Their mission? To put the G5 through her paces and route back to Savannah for completion. Work continued back in Savannah, this time under the supervision of Garrett Aviation. The main research power rack was installed. Communications and air conditioning for passengers were fitted. A stripped down galley put in place. Seats were checked for safety during high G impacts. And while the plane was being worked on, its future crews were also put to the test. NCAR's scientists, technicians, and engineers all had to learn how to survive both fire and water. Painting Hyper was also an engineering requirement. Paint protects against corrosion and reduces friction. But Garrett's young designer gave the G5 a sports car gloss right down to the detailing. taken so much, so much to get here. You know, it's the 20 years of off and on effort to secure the funding and then just the effort of getting the aircraft modified and testing and uh, it's just been an almost a calculable effort to get it to this point. It's just been incredible. So it's wonderful to finally be here and, and to get to bring it back to Colorado and, and see everybody there. I just can't wait. I can't wait. Hyper's arrival at Jefferson County Airport, close to Boulder, merited a ceremonial flyby. That was beautiful. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> That's beautiful. I want to see it again. A new observatory like this is an investment in the future of science and the next generation of scientists. The men and women on board the plane and those who turned out to greet her would be Hyper's new family for decades to come. 